Let's talk about the honey of calm in summer now, the stillness in 21 scenes. And that's also from Aesthetic Du Mal by uh, Wallace Stevens. And if you notice, a number of the, these plays that we've talked about just today, uh, I, I dropped the act structure and just went with scenes. Uh, I did that with with uh, the second woman. I did it in the Helen play, the Helen Wagner play, and the Jerry. Well, the Jerry the Jew is in three acts, but but uh, sometimes you, I just want to have a continuum of scenes. You have, uh, I think, the uh, I other you talked about lastly um, in six acts. What is the difference? And then it doesn't have any scenes in it. What is the difference in your mind between breaking them up into acts and scenes? What's the difference of the, of the word choice that you use there? The act, an act is a totally complete thing that it's an argument with its own answer, in a sense. A scene is a scene that will often leaves a door open. Uh, so an act an act is, is, is a harder, more completed, more rounded, more compacted. It's the difference between, say, uh, Having a real a chapter hard, and a paragraph. Well, well, it ha uh, the act will be a snowball that's compacted well into itself, whereas uh, a scene is maybe just a uh, uh, steps in snow, the, the footprint. Uh, a, a scene, uh, even if it's longer than an act, uh, it's the act in and of itself is more. I don't know. It, it's more rounded, more completed. You could read. You could read a full act and maybe get a whole summary or an idea of that, and it could almost stand alone as a one-act play in a sense, whereas the scenes I don't think could. So it's the difference between, say, a line in a stanza or a paragraph in a chapter? Perhaps, yeah. I mean... I wanted to speak about this one. Uh, this, is, this play, I think, is a great play. However, it is one of those plays that, that while well, intellectually stimulated me, I do despise it. It reminds me of Persona by Bergman, um, in that a lot of uh, devices are used, uh, and almost pretension is used, and it's basically you just wagging your dick around throughout the entirety of this play, um, and saying what a great playwright you are. Well, uh, I do I just, just so you know, this play, I, I, I watched The Silence by Bergman before, so I wanted to have the train and the, the thing, uh, the, 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 mo the hotel. I also had the idea of the Shining Hotel in my mind. I mentioned this in, within the play, too. And also, uh, there's the, there's the uh, last, last year at Marion Bod that, that we, I, I call it the, what is the Hotel of Infinity, Hotel Infinity, or, or whatnot. And, there, and there's that old logical theorem about the Hotel Infinity, that no matter how many people you stuff in, you could get the per other people just have to move one room over and you'd never run out of rooms. And so it's, a, it's about a character named Terry see, Verniak. Verniak. And, uh, and it's one of the few plays I, where I have the males as the lead. Women dominate. So this, this is one of the few plays like the Henry Miller play, where the, the lead character is a male. And you make that point uh, later on in the play, too. You also use the Proustian device later on when you're talking about Candy Moore. Yeah. Uh, but what, what do you think of my posit that this is sort of like Persona as well? Do you, do you agree with it? Well, I do, I do have the characters... It reminds me of your, of your poem of... Uh, that, that poem that you use the Plath quote with, where it's... Uh, with no oh, okay. Uh, well, I mean, this is not a play I like either, but it was one that I wanted to do. Originally, I was going to have it more realistic, but I, I, but really, just the day before I started the play, I said a couple of weeks ago, I said, "Let me watch. Let me watch this Bergman film." Uh, sometimes you get these ideas that are in your mind, and I watch it, and I said, "Oh, that's it." I was originally going to have this more as a play, the Terry Verniak character having these two things. The missing girl from his teen years during the bicentennial summer. Did he kill her? Did he not kill her? Uh, the fact that he cut off two of his fingers as a kid and couldn't feel, he was desensitized somehow. That's a, that The real character it's based on uh, uh, did that. Uh, the fact 
that there's this accident that happens, you know, in the early O's where he accidentally kills some people. Was he doing drugs? He was a drug addict before in his life. Uh, the fact that he had a father who was not loving. The fact we get the reappearance of his younger brother Joe, who appears in brief candles in a in one of the playlets as a racist and whatnot. And we see he's still an asshole years later. We get his ugly sister. We get told about his gay brother, uh, 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 Big Jerry. Uh, but we don't see him. I'm going to have him in a later play probably come. And we get uh, Danny. We get uh, a lot of these kind of very Mari and Bad like characters. The man and woman on a train. We get A, B, C, and D, which yeah. almost... It reminds me of the park. Yeah. Um, but, it all, it, it, but it also goes back to what we just did with the prisoner. You know, uh, there's one of the, the days is A, B, and C. Uh, we also get... With that ABC, C, and D, we get the Nowhere Man. They talk about the organization. They talk about they come from what is it, the, the council or something. Uh, we get a we get a blonde we get a blonde boy just like in Persona, which was the same actor who was in the Silence. We get the the two dead people, Gino and Sue Klosterman. We get the whipped man, you know, a, a character that's just walking around the halls that has whip marks on his back. We get the dwarf, which is a throwback to to uh, my uh, Tetramile play. Uh, we get the black actress. We get the little black girl with the Mickey Mouse, you know, afro, with the little ears that a lot of black kids have. And we get Soldier 1 and 2, which again references back to uh, the Bergman, the silence play, where they're traveling in this strange country where there seemed to be war going on. So uh, that's the whole setup, is to how, how, to, how to put the mind of this Terry character, who's who's not that bright, who's suffering from something, some kind of midlife crisis. We're told that he's in his mid-50s here. Uh, so how to do that interestingly? I could have done a more realistic play, but I didn't want to do necessarily a realistic play um, because the character was just not that interesting. But I wanted to tell his story. Uh, you mentioned Candy Moore, and I talk about the Proustian Madeline. And initially I was going to have Terry Moore a character that's four years older than Danny Wagner or myself, be the one because. But I remember, and this is another thing. Just like I, I something told me to rewatch Bergman's *The Silence*. A week or so before I started writing this play, I was googling, as I say in the play, I was googling up Lucille Ball, and I hadn't thought about this girl. She was this beautiful blonde daughter of the Lucille Ball character in her second show. She was on for one or two years and then disappeared. She was this big teen star in the 1960s. She disappears. She becomes the the, the model for a, a well-known Cars album. The Cars were a big rock group uh, in the late 70s, early 80s called Candy O, presumably named after her, maybe not. But I just thought that was so interesting. And I had totally forgotten about her. I, you know, I had the Valerie Vivello character based on Valerie Bertinelli, who was my... my uh, my little lust throb, heart throb, uh, when I was ten, uh, like 10 years old. But I'd forgotten that this ca this girl was in the show that I saw when I was three or four. And I remember as a boy just like looking at this beautiful blonde girl who was then in her teens. Uh, and I said, that's interesting. I totally forgot that, that she existed on that show because she was only in for maybe two of the six or seven years it was on air. And, and I said, that's interesting. But it was too deep a thing to put in the mouths of this idiot Terry. So I had to have Danny Wagner have that Proustian moment. So that that that's one of the things where you have to just sort of uh, do it. But anyway, so we get the... Danny in here is probably the most un-Danny-like that I've seen. Um, he, it, it may be more realistic coming from him, but the entire play, play is so surreal throughout uh, that... It just doesn't seem like it. There's something off about it. He speaks about things. Well, I mean, it it is in a sense, Danny. Through, I mean, everything is viewed in a sense, even though it's not literally viewed through Terry's eyes. Terry is the protagonist or the antagonist, if you will. Everything is is going through Terry. I mean, he goes through these scenes here. We we uh, we see him with his father. His father says, "Get the fuck out of the room." So. Once he's once he's expelled, he he. I mean, it starts with him running in circles around this train car, you know, and then it ends with and the same thing with the, the Fellini like dance of the characters, sort of like at the end of Eight and a Half. Um, it's that reminiscent of another Kubrick film, Eyes Wide Shut, that 
every bit of reality in this has to be questioned. Yeah. Even even certain realistic scenes. Yeah, and that, that's a good thing. And you know, he he meets these A, B, and C cat, C and D characters. Uh, then he meets the bellboy, um, uh, and and they they talk. Sometimes they talk obscure and what. So, uh, another another thing that in the back of my mind, uh, in the nineteen seventies, the Doctor Who played by Tom Baker often had these scene or often had these episodes that were very surreal. And Tom Baker was a great actor, the best of the doctors uh, of all time, in my opinion. Um, but, uh, you know, he gets to these rooms, and all of these rooms are room 13-something. And you know, in America at least, uh, uh, most hotels don't have a 13th floor. They go from the 12th to the 14th floor. I don't know if you knew that. No. Yeah, because, because of superstition. Uh, probably three-quarters of hotels that go above 13 floors don't have a 13th floor. So if they have 20 floors, the 20th floor will be room will be floor 21, the 19th will be 20th, and so on. And, and the 12th floor will be 12th, but the 13th floor will be called the 14th floor, because 13, Triskaidekaphobia. So that's why everything takes place on the 13th floor. There was that film, I don't know if you remember in the late 90s, there was a film called The 13th Floor, which was just about that, about how hotels... And uh, you know, and that—that's a surreal science fiction film. So that's why everything is set on the thirteenth floor. The cultural hermeticism. Um, yeah. Just aware of that. Um, I did think that despite, despite that, I did like the ending as well as appreciate it intellectually. So there's a sort of schism with how much I despised most of the play, and then the ending, which I thought was great. As well, well as let me ask you what. Part. Let me ask you emotionally. Why did you dislike the play? versus appreciating an intellectual. Let me ask you. Well, emotionally, I, I disliked it because I, I've always had a tendency to dislike things that are not direct. Mm -hmm. And and this one, since it's all over the place, and re remind me so much of Persona where he's just throwing basically everything out there and having moments of pretension in it. And I loathe pretension. Emotionally, I couldn't Set, but I have to admire the technique that's used. I mean, every there's so many techniques used to create this surreal world that there's no way that I can't intellectually appreciate it. And I got ideas out of this play too. But as far as anything to do with emotionally like it, I, I hated most of this play. Uh, the ending I did think was very effective, where the soldiers come in and, and chase after Terry, and then Daddy yeah, has this great monologue where he says, where can he run to? Do not fret people. No one can run forever. Not even Terry. Dirty act. Oh, he'll try. Everyone run. We all do. Some better and farther than others. Some not at all. But Terry is aging as we speak. We all do, of course, but his age is catching up to him more quickly than anyone else has ever had. And then it goes on, and he continues to run as the soldiers eventually gang him. And then the blonde boy comes out at the end, just like in Persona. Well, Harry is seemingly dead on the floor, and you've got this this, these surreal images and light that is coming down upon him. Yeah, and and the boy, the, the blonde boy says, well then deal with it, you idiot, and get the fuck out of my room, which indicates who is the blonde boy. And so you have that kind of thing. But I would ask you, I would say that even though it's not quite as surreal, uh, this play structurally has some things in common with uh, the play uh, Theodore. Um, and it, did you like emotionally like Theodore more than this play? Well, yes, because that's a it's still a realistic drama. This one has very little realism in it, and you have to put everything in doubt. The, the surrealism may act realistically. It's sort of like you can appreciate something diegetically, but you can't possibly accept this reality outside of its diegesis. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, there, there's certainly the Twilight Zone aspect. The, the thing you quoted, Danny, is acting very much Serling-like there. You know, the, the people have their scream moment where they, they, they pose like Mook scream. Um, but, yeah, but, well, there's, there's that aspect, but there's also just the, the layering off the Kafka aspect. You, you basically throw in many artists and many artworks of artists that I may like individually that I don't otherwise like emotionally, like Kafka and some of Bergman's more pretentious works like Persona, which 
we have to kind of differentiate between something that is pretentious but also great. Mm. I mean, what, what Bergman does with Persona, I still think that, even though that I don't think that's Bergman's greatest film, I do think that it is his most non real film, in yeah. that I don't think anyone else directing that film would have got what he got out of it. Well, here, for example, I was just talking about stage directions. This probably has the most com complex stage directions of yeah, any play that I have. I would agree. But but it's it's done it's done in in the service of the visual aspects. There, it's not just poetic writing for poetic writing. It, it's talking about using the lighting here and there to get effects. What did you think? Let me just ask you though. Uh, of the Verniak family, uh, we get Terry. We get his shitty little brother Joe. We get his his ignorant father Bob. And then we get his ugly sister Maria. What did you think? And and his aunt Rose shows up there. What did you think of that as a family? And did you think? What did you think of Terry as the main character? Well, Terry as the main character was odd. Um, I think that it works because a lot of dreams and a lot of surrealism often have very banal imagery. So it works with him. Whereas I think if Danny was imagining this, it wouldn't work. I wouldn't accept some of the banality. That Terry otherwise has. As a family, they're very repugnant characters. Um, it's, it's almost like a, a sitcom clan brought up to, to the maximum realism that they can be accepted into this universe. Um, I thought that the, the father of Terry, uh, he, he's almost an exaggerated character. He's almost a ver Terry's version of Joe. Uh, we don't see that the gay brother, I assume that he's as. <laughs> fucked up as all of them, though. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't even. I, I recall very little things. We also have to. Uh, well, we do. We do find out one thing that the gay brother likes sniffing underwear. So. <laughs> and Terry also has this grudge against Danny for fucking a girlfriend. That's yeah. Me. Well, a girl that he it. wanted. Um. But yeah. So so, uh, did you read the next play then after that? I, I read it. Right prior to our conversation. Okay, I other than human. So these are two very. Uh, these are the, probably along with uh, the Tetramal play, uh, a persuasion gentler. These are probably the three most absurdist of my plays, um, and I did these two back to back. What did you think then? Well, let's talk about I other than human, and then let's compare the two plays then. 